Welcome back, everyone, to the All of Life for God podcast. We are now in week eight of a series going through uh, the major themes of the Westminster Shorter Catechism, as explained by the three co-authors of glorifying and enjoying God. The forever is implied, of course, because the Westminster Shorter Catechism begins with that question. In the studio here at RHB, I have Jonathan Cruz. Again, uh, the last time we saw him was just a few weeks ago. He and I have chosen to wear the same clothes <laughs> as two weeks ago. And I still haven't showered since those two <laughs> recordings either. We're doing these back to back. And today what we're going to talk about is the means of grace. The means of grace. And if you've been following along with us the last few weeks, you know that we started with Jonathan in week five on redemption in Christ's work, which then segued into justification and faith. Episode seven was Andrew Miller on sanctification and the Holy Spirit, which was an exceptional episode, I'd have to say. Yours were too, Jonathan. Thank you. They were very good. I'm not surprised to hear that my co-authors, though, are exceptional. <laughs> They're wonderful guys. And now we're talking about... Gentlemen them. and scholars. Yes, they are. <clears throat> and ministers. All three of you. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about the means of grace. And why don't you start, Jonathan, by just explaining what we're actually talking about? The means of grace are the 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 means or the mode or the method, the way that God's grace comes to his people in order to uh, build them up encourage, strengthen them, challenge them, uh, grow them in the faith. That would be a, uh, a succinct way of defining them. What are the means of, or what do the means of grace exist for? Then we talk about what are they then? Uh, but the, the catechism says, how is the word of God made effectual to salvation? Um, oh, wait, sorry. I want to actually go up. Uh, one more question. Question 80. What are the outward and ordinary means, methods, whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption? So Christ has has redeemed us. He he did the, the act of atonement, and he lived the perfect life, died the death, and was raised and ascended. He's interceding. All of that, all of that that he's done, how um, does it communicate? How does it come to us? And the answer is the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of of redemption are his ordinances. That's another word you'll hear, especially at this time. Um, I mean, in that, that time period, especially or particularly word, the word sacraments and prayer, all of which are made effectual to salvation. And um, how does, how did these things then become effectual to salvation? How does God use these things? The catechism really spends that, that was question 80, 89. Through the rest of the cha- uh, the rest of the catechism, they're answering those questions. We're talking about the Word of God, the sacraments, and prayer up to the very end, because question one hundred seven is the conclusion to the yeah. Lord's prayer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we have a number of different things that you've mentioned. You've mentioned prayer, the Word, mm-hmm. which we're we're talking about Scripture. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And um, the sacraments. Mm-hmm. So those three. Essentially. Yeah, kind of out of order. Normally, word, sacraments, prayers. I read it backwards on my sheet. Yeah. That's why I did, That's why it's backwards. Okay, yeah. Word, sacraments, prayer. Yeah, that makes me feel better. I, it's, well, no, no, I actually, that's, 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 that, that leads to a question, then why that order? Well, yeah, no, great question, because first off, without the word, we don't have anything. Um, the, the word is the basis of the sacraments. The sacraments are visible confirmations of God's word. And also, when it comes to prayer, God's Word should actually direct our prayer life and even fill our prayers themselves. So uh, we want to give the Word the the primacy uh, of place here. Okay. Let's. Um, we'll come back to the Word. What about the um, What about the sacraments? We'll come back to the Word after I just said that that's the, the primacy of place. Uh huh. <laughs> What about the sacraments, Tavis? What do you want to know about the sacraments? What I want to know is, um, and this is actually related to a recent discussion I've had with my children. Okay. Um, Yeah, actually, my daughter was asking why some of her friend's parents Mm -hmm. are divorced Mm. and 
why her mommy and daddy are together. Why do people get married? Like all these questions about marriage. Okay. And I recalled that according to some traditions, marriage is a sacrament. Sure. Yeah. Um, Whereas for other traditions, there are just the two sacraments, which would be Holy Communion and baptism. Yeah. So, but let's talk about sacrament. Yeah. And especially as we're relating it to the main theme, which is a means of grace. Yeah. So, Sure. Tell me what is a sacrament and how is it a means or a, or a what would you call it, a conduit? Yeah, sure. Of, of getting grace to us. Getting yeah. grace, receiving grace. Well, uh, question 92. What is a sacrament? Okay. A sacrament is a holy ordinance instituted by Christ, hmm. which would be, um, if we uh, have that as a, 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 a uh, requisite for defining a sacrament, marriage would fall short there. Marriage was instituted by God in the garden, not by Christ. Uh, so the Roman Catholic Church has seven sacraments, I okay. believe. Um, and uh, here's the test. Is it instituted by Christ? Uh, and then it goes on to say, wherein by sensible signs, Christ and the benefits of the new covenant are represented, sealed, and applied to believers. So the gospel is represented, sealed, and applied uh, marriage, we can say, does represent the gospel. The Bible says that in Ephesians 5, right? This is a, a picture of how Christ loved mm. the church, yeah. um, and yet it's not instituted by Christ. You can kind of take this as a, um, a, a, here's a litmus test for what people might claim to be our sacraments and say, well, is it instituted by Christ? And, and right there, you get down to just two. <laughs> but even if you yeah. you know use these others, well, does it, so, uh, does it signify uh, the gospel? Maybe, but does it seal it to you? Does it actually apply it to you? Uh-huh. Probably not. Uh, so uh, a sacrament then is something that Christ has ordained for his church uh-huh. as a means of pointing to the gospel, but also applying the gospel uh, to our hearts. Okay. Let's get metaphysical. What is it? How, what is this application? Okay. we. And the reason I'm asking this is we've talked about justification, adoption, redemption, you know, these these fancy but very, very important theological terms that enable us to understand the work that God has done. Let's get so, metaphysical. Okay. Meaning we've been saved. What do we need? What do we why do we need salvation applied to us? What are, what are the divines getting at here? They're getting at how weak we are. Mm, okay. We're we're how sinful we are. Uh and what we have before us, um, once when we're converted, is a long, arduous, difficult pilgrimage from earth to heaven, mm. and we need all the help we can get, yeah. uh, and we need divine help and divine support, yeah. and the means of grace are just that. God instructs us in the way that we should go through his word, um, not just reading it, but especially the preaching of his word. He uh, gives us promises in his word that, that um, strengthen our faith and... Those promises are confirmed in the sacraments in particular. Um, and so, so doubting is, is doused by uh, the sacraments, okay. right? It's, it's, yeah. All our fears are kind of, and anxieties are put to flight when we can see and when we can touch, taste um, in tangible ways, this is God and he's for me. Yeah. Um, and then prayer, right? Wouldn't it be a sad thing if um, our God was... Uh, just a distant God said, so this is what you need to do. Here's some helps I've given you stay along the path and just trust me in the end. We'll, we'll, we'll meet up, but we don't ever get to talk to him on the, along the way. Right. You know, you can imagine how difficult that would be. Uh, you're taking a lot, you know, a, a long road trip away from your family. Maybe you're heading towards your family and you know, you have the car, you've got the gas, you know how you need to get there. You have the hotel stops along the way, you know what you need to do to get there. Yeah. But boy, you'd love to call your family uh, on the road, hear their voice, um, be encouraged by the fact that um, it's this isn't a fantasy. They're real. They're really there. You're going to be with them soon. Right. Prayer is a means of doing that for us too. So yeah. God gives us the means of grace because we're such weak and, and forgetful and frail sinners that need help. Uh-huh. And so he communicates to us. He reminds us that he really is our God and he's for us and we can communicate to him, talk with him. We could say that the word and the sacraments are, are God speaking to us, but he is not so austere that he doesn't let us open our mouth and speak to him. No, he, mm-hmm. he welcomes us mm-hmm. to 
to talk to him. And what's that? What do we call that when two people are talking uh, regularly? That We call that a relationship. We have a relationship mm-hmm. with God, and that is truly what sustains us. It's our communion with God. Yeah, yeah. So obviously you have just been talking a lot about prayer, mm-hmm. which is another one of these means of grace. Um, the the Lord's Prayer, The how much time is given to the Lord's Prayer in the Catechism? I mean, just off the top of your head. Off the top of my head, uh, 10 questions. Okay. Something like that. I think Bill Bocas. I was going to say, this is somebody else's territory, so. No, no, I know, but I know that, and I know that, oh, no, it was Andrew, and we talked about that for a while, which is the next episode, everyone. Yeah. But, um, but prayer is not limited to the Lord's Prayer. No. And, and the, the Catechism has a great definition of prayer. Prayer is an offering up of our desires unto God. He, mm. he loves to know how we feel and what we're longing for for things agreeable to his will in the name of Christ with confession of our sin and thankful acknowledgement of his mercies. Um, A great definition of prayer. And when we pray in that way, it's actually a means of sanctification, right? To submit ourselves to the will of God, um, to confess our sins, to force ourselves, because let's be honest, sometimes we need to force ourselves to acknowledge God with thankfulness for Mm -hmm. all that he's done for us. Mm -hmm. That's a, um, a way in which we grow in grace to have that, um, that mindset that wants to pray according to God's will is ready to, and eager to confess sins is always ready to to praise God for his goodness to us. And that's a, again, another point of the means of grace. It's to grow us in godliness. So we, I think it's easy maybe to understand how the word can do that, right? There's instruction there, things for us to obey and to do, Yeah. but even prayer is a means of sanctification when we yeah. pray uh, right, when we pray the way that, the catechism is telling us the Bible says we need to pray. Yeah. What's interesting to me when considering these three, uh, I guess we would say topics within the means of grace, so that's the word, Mm -hmm. sacraments, and prayer, is the communal aspect of them. Yes. And because as we know, the the Christian walk is not something we do alone. Right. Praise God for that. Yep. Praise God for that. And you talked to use this analogy just a minute ago where you're on this road trip, you're heading towards your family. But what came into my head is me sitting alone in a, in a car, you know, it was like an old hot rod. I don't know why that came into my mind, <laughs> like driving through the desert yeah, and everything. Right, yeah. But actually, actually we're not alone in that car, right? We, God's put us into community with yep. other believers. Yeah. So the word is something we can do individually mm. and mm. communally. I mean, we can work. We, we can. can read the Bible at I, home. I, no, absolutely. Right. But I think in terms uh, of the I'm catechism, I'm not talking about like private interpretation of scripture. That leads oh no, you no, off I understand. But it's thing. just interesting that the catechism itself uh, wants to uh, prioritize what happens in that communal aspect. Okay, because it says. Um, uh, how is the word made effectual to salvation? The spirit of God makes the reading, but especially the preaching, it says, of the word. Especially the preaching. Especially the preaching. An effectual means of convincing and converting sinners, of building them up in holiness and comfort through faith unto salvation. So the spirit uses the reading, right? Yeah. You, you mean that God will do that through your private reading of your Bible. Like, uh-huh. yes, amen. But yeah. he especially uses the preaching of his word. God loves preaching. God love. I think that's something we maybe we don't talk about enough. <clears throat> we often, you know, as fallen humans, um, even as Christians, could kind of take or leave preaching. Uh, mm. You know, if you think about a worship service, most of it's interactive until the sermon. So it's kind of the opportunity for us to check out. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm not doing anything. It's just passive. Now he can do all the talking and. And we can think it's boring, and um, we can have a low estimation of preaching. And yet Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 23, um, it pleased God through the folly of preaching, mm-hmm. right, to bring about salvation. Mm-hmm. It's something that God, this, this brought pleasure. Preaching brings pleasure to God. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I, wow, well, as Christians, shouldn't we want to be pleased by the things that God's pleased by? Mm-hmm. So there's a primacy then. Yes, reading my Bible is important at home. Private family worship is is critical to my uh, growth and godliness. But even in God's design, he uses preaching in a way that he does in a way that's distinct and I think um, um, uh, more effective or more effectual than just private reading because he loves preaching. This is God's method. What is the Christian parent's greatest responsibility? To teach their children to trust the one true living God. Enrich your family devotions from the Family Worship Bible Guide. This precious book offers rich devotional thoughts for children of all ages on every chapter in the Bible. To learn more about the Family Worship Bible Guide, visit heritagebooks.org. This is very interesting to me because of the fact that, and I, I admit that I've fallen into this at times, is thinking about my private time of devotion, or let's say scripture reading, yeah. mm-hmm. and the Sunday sit through the sermon with or without coffee, let the hearer understand, is... Uh, <laughs> Are you down with uh, with Twitter? Yeah, yeah, the Twitter or X hyper controversy. Anyway, I did. Do you want to talk about that? <laughs> not right, not right now. <laughs> this isn't going to come out for eight weeks anyway. Yeah, right. It'll it'll be on to something else by then. But to get back to the point is, um, I myself confess I have fallen into this idea of like, well, what's in it for me? Mm-hmm. Or or reading scripture of like, how can I apply this to my life today? Yeah. And same with the, the sermon. It's like, was I taught anything I didn't know? Yeah. Or was it a good good sermon or a yeah, bad sermon? Sure. But thinking of it rather in the terms you're describing and the, and the catechism describes as we're, we're being, God is dispensing yeah. grace what to is, us. What is God doing in like this? That that's... takes it to not just a different level, but like that's a whole nother realm of, existence. Yeah. It, it's completely different than the reading a self-help book approach. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Like there's something really, really important going on. Yeah. And that's what we we need to reclaim and, it's not and recover. Just God, like in, I may be mischaracterizing uh, this, but like in a charismatic sense, like God is blessing me. God is blessing me. But, but um, whatever that means, but um Rather, God is dispensing grace to me unto salvation. Whether I feel like it or not is the important thing. I mean, I know people who, you know, attend a church, maybe they have a couple of pastors, and if the pastor, uh, the, the preaching pastor that day is, is not their favorite, they don't go. What? That God's, God's means of grace don't come to you through the giftedness of a preacher, mm. the personality of a preacher, the style of a preacher. It's through the preaching of the word. Yeah. Right? I, yeah. I found the verse I was butchering earlier, verse 21. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. In fact, it would almost suggest, I think this is Paul's, one of his big arguments in the first few chapters of Corinthians, you know, the skill of the preacher... The, um, it should not factor into this at all. He talks about not preaching with eloquent words of wisdom, right? And and so I think a lot of times we approach uh, sitting under a sermon in a consumeristic model. What am I going to get out of it? Or I don't like this guy. It's going to be boring for me. Mm-hmm. But God works through foolish preaching and un, uh, unpolished preachers to do the same thing that he does through very gifted preachers because it's the act itself. It's mm. not the person in the pulpit. It's mm. the act of preaching yeah. that God has said, this is a means of grace to convince sinners, to convert them, and to comfort them. So why wouldn't you want to be under that every week? So that that changes kind of the discussion in a way of how long should you preach and what should you wear when you're preaching. And I mean, not that these are not important, but maybe there's something that takes priority over those yeah, discussions so. and maybe governs those discussions sure. 
you know, let's to, make the to main make thing sure, the main thing. Yeah. 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 Fair enough. But then, okay. So let's move on then. Well, uh, well I want to go yeah, back go ahead, to, go you, well, you just talked about the communal nature and being like in a car by yourself. Yeah. Yeah. And so I did want to say that I think it is really important to um, note that these means of grace find their uh, proper home within the church. I mean, that is where preaching takes place. That is where the sacraments take place. Um, you should not be having, you know, sacraments at home as part of private worship um, or, you know, getting baptized by dunking your sibling in the hot tub, you know, someday when you feel real extra spiritual. Let's let's go get baptized. This is all meant to take place within the bounds of the church, and the, the church is called the house of prayer, right? So all of these things um, find their proper home within the church, mm-hmm. and within the church is the body of believers. So I think— it could be said that a means of grace is also the communion of saints, right? These things take place within the context where Christians are together. They're encouraging one another. They're learning together. They're, they're encouraging one another. And so that's really important too. God's grace comes to us um, through, through that means as well, yeah. through, through the church. Yeah. So that's not explicitly stated here in the catechism, but I think it's something we, should, we could definitely imply from the catechism. Well, the things it's talking about as means of grace— those all happen at church. Hmm. Maybe I should be at church. Maybe there are other blessings to be had when I'm at church. Yeah. Would you say that, and maybe what the catechism say or the divine say, that church is really where these things, what's, how do I phrase this? Our private practice at home, either alone or with family, Yeah. Um, rather than informing our experience at Church. It's the other way around. It's the other way around. Yeah. I mean, even if you think about how the week is structured, which comes first, Sunday's the first day of the week. Mm-hmm. Right. So that should be fueling everything that happens Monday through Saturday at home. The way that we pray alone, the way that yeah. we read scripture. You should alone. be learning how to pray through the public prayers from your pastor, your elders at church, right? And yeah. how to read the Bible uh, for yourself or how to teach it to your family from what goes on at church. And, um, and then, encouraging your family, getting your family to long for that that coming day when you'll be mm-hmm. back in God's house and it happens all over again and you're fed all over again. You know, it's so important for me and my wife to to remind our kids, to teach our kids, to tell them at a young age, Sunday is the best day of the week. Mm. And well, there's a couple of ways you can do that, get them excited about, it, not just by saying it over and over again, but, you know, like doing, um, having special little rituals or routines, like you're going to have a special breakfast on Sundays, like things that get them excited about the whole day. Yeah. And, and that's, that for us, that has not been an issue yet. Our kids love Sunday. They're social. So they love seeing their friends. Yeah. Um, but of course the prayers as they grow up, it's, they love the other aspects that they're, that they, right now they're kind of absorbing and maybe a imperceptible way. Um, you know, they know the doxology, the Lord's prayer, cause we say those things all the time. My, my son can, can uh, participate in the the um, uh, liturgy leading up to the Lord's Supper. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. He, he gets all that call and response. But as he grows older, it's like, oh, this is why Sunday is the best mm-hmm. day of the week. Because, and we'll ask him, why, why is it the best day of the week? Um, and sometimes we don't get the answer we want. You know, it's, oh, well, because we get to... Uh, we get to watch a movie Sunday afternoon, you know, while mom and dad are sleeping. <laughs> okay. Yeah, we get it. We, we know you like that, but really why is it? And, and, and the answer that they'll come back to is because we get to meet with God. Mm. We get to meet with God mm. and God meets with us through what the catechism is, is showing us here through the, his word, through God's word, through sacraments and through prayer. It's mm. a good word. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you all have enjoyed this. This was our eighth week. Third one with Jonathan Cruz. Thanks, yeah. Jonathan. It's yeah, really and I hope and I hope they uh, uh, the listeners would be interested in yeah some swag that you were oh yeah supposed I keep to, to talk about this to, yeah <laughs> why don't you hold <laughs> you can hold this one up we do have some swag for all of you because we really believe in the power of this book to change your life to change your family's life and we want to emphasize that through some of the the gear this is Campy Mug. There's RHB, glorifying God. Oh, glorify God and enjoy him forever. Um, and T-shirts. We have all this stuff up on the RHB website. Get some of this stuff, but most importantly, get that book. Teach your family with mm-hmm. it. If you're a pastor, take your church through the, the Westminster Shorter Catechism. 
And it, it must be said too that Bill Bilkestein comes from it, comes at this book from the Heidelberg Catechism, correct? Right, yeah, the Dutch Reformed tradition. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, correct. That's right. So his comments are going to be interwoven in there as well. So if you're someone who's maybe not a, what would you call yourself, Jonathan? A Westminsterian? A Presbyterian. 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 That's a good word for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's something there for you too. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and yeah. I think it really drew out the, um, a, a, a richness in, in the book having those different perspectives. So, what if you're a Lutheran, like the big guy sitting oh, next to me? Read the book and then be a Presbyterian by the end. <laughs> All right, yeah. everyone. Thank you so much, thank you. and we will see you uh, two more times next week. Will be Andrew Miller on the Lord's Prayer, which we slightly touched on today, but he's really going to elaborate further on that specific prayer. Uh, which is, of course, a means of grace. And then after that, we're ending with Bill Bokestein on internal life and judgment. Thanks for joining us. Thank you for listening to All of Life for God by Reformation Heritage Books. If you have enjoyed this episode and would like to hear more, please consider subscribing and sharing with a friend. Reformation Heritage Books is a nonprofit ministry aiming to strengthen the church through Reformed, Puritan, and experiential literature. To learn more about this ministry and how to support us, please visit rhb.org.